everyone. Welcome back to those of you who were with us before our break. Um, and welcome to, I see a lot of new faces, so that's great. Um, my name is Taya Peterson, and I lead the design arm of the UKI Innovation Labs at SAP. And as you've heard from our colleagues earlier, at SAP we are working with businesses to help them think and act around the circular economy. Today and tomorrow, we're welcoming some leading voices from the world of design who are sharing their perspectives on the future of materials. You heard earlier around the future of fashion. Um, and with 41% of all UK household waste deemed difficult to recycle by the WRAP, circularity provides an opportunity to improve upon that number and to keep objects um, and extend their life cycle. And then not only is that more sustainable, but it improves the profitability of those objects by about 1.5 times across the value chain. While we see more and more designers adopting a circular approach, only 48% of our material waste is even being captured for recycling, upcycling, and repurposing. This is due to many factors, difficulties with our traditional supply chains, a lack of secondary materials markets, means that a future for the reuse of materials remains difficult to scale, and all too often waste is then just remaining waste. We are seeing opportunities with extended producer responsibility legislation, corporations are being pushed to design and account for the full life cycle of their product, products, and then putting this challenge and opportunity onto designers. Um, and so today I'm excited to be joined by Andu Masibo and Jameis Taylor, who have been tackling um, just this. So please join me in welcoming uh, Andu Masibo. He is a fellow Royal College of Art alum and prior to Receiving his master's in product design at the Royal College of Art, he worked in the fabrication industries, uh, and now his work is focused on engaging with the way objects came into being, the condition under which things are produced, and the wider systems that dictates their context beyond their production. He is joined by Jameis Taylor, who is a London-based designer, maker, and founder of Greater Goods. Jameis has a strong interest in working with existing product as raw material, and seeing the potential where others see junk. Thanks for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> this is going to sound a little bit facetious, but um, I am actually very reluctant to ever frame a project in the context of sustainability because I feel like, as a designer, that should be baked in. There sh it should be baked into the concept from the start. And if you use sustainability as a reason to do a project, there's a kind of a lie in that somewhere. So in this project that I did for, for LDF, I found a car that was nearing the end of its life and I found all of the owners that lived with it and I got stories from them about what the car meant to them over their life with it. And then I used those stories as a basis or a reason to make objects of furniture so that, that th those stories could live on. So there's kind of like a sustainable element built into that from the start where I'm reusing something that would other otherwise be scrapped. But what I'm focusing on is a kind of a deeper kind of like almost cultural or emotional shift towards how do we treat materials, how do we, how do we treat things that we live with, and like what could be a kind of like an idea of how they might live on beyond. Um, and as, as you mentioned, like my, my background's in fabrication, so I, I made things a long time before I, I designed them, and I am much more interested in what's going on behind the curtain or, or in the background. So in this project, I reached out to Jameis, Great Goods, um, to help. And I was really keen for it to be a kind of collaborative process. So we together designed the daybed. And I kind of, I set some parameters because of like how I had to make the frame, for instance. But I really wanted you guys to just do your thing because you're the experts in that space and then bring that into the project because the project gains from that as well. So, yeah, I don't know. If you don't mind, for those who have not yet had a chance to go through and see the work, can you kind of give us a brief summary of what the, what the kind of you know, project was and what, what you created? Yeah, so I created, in total, there were eight objects of furniture. Um, and uh, there were two kind of like general approaches to making the objects. One was like more lent on the materiality of the car. There's, there's a certain fact in the objects in a car that allow you to do something with them. Um, and then the other was um, 
drawing from the stories and making much more contextually rich objects. So I made a coffee table, um, some freestanding shelves, and then a smaller wall-based objects, and then together we made a, a day bed from, made from, I mean, there's a picture that will pop up in a second, but made from the repurposed upholstery of the car. But I guess, yeah, I don't know, how, how was it? Yeah, so I, I still remember the day getting the, the email from you and the, the short deck showing a car getting craned onto a truck or some kind. Um, and yeah, I run the, the small studio, Greater Goods. It's a team of uh, four of us, two of us being part-time, so incredibly small. Um, but that gives us the flexibility to work on projects like this, taking a, a car interior and turning it into a daybed. Um, and just going back to the point you made of sustainability being baked into a project, that's kind of the foundations that Greater Goods was kind of built on. Um, it should just be normalized to use something that's going to waste. Um, using the car upholstery, suddenly we had four different types of fabric, all these incredible trims and details, which we've kind of kept the DNA in the final daybed. So you can look at the daybed and you can see that it's still, it's essentially a car interior because of the lines and the patterns in, in the materials. Um, and yeah, it was an incredible project, first of its kind that we've done. Um, we found that like stripping the interior apart was incredibly messy, but we made it work and uh, the final piece is amazing. Can you talk a little bit about Greater Goods, your company, and you know your approach to sustainability? Sure, yeah, so Greater Goods started when I graduated university not too long ago, um, back in 2018. My background's actually graphic design, so I come from a, a more laptop-focused um, discipline. And then after that, I was in carpentry for a year, um, just making things at home. And that's when, I guess, Greater Goods was founded. I was finding wood um, and discarded materials in my local area, turning into new things, and then selling them locally. Um, and it was just the way I was brought up. My family were, I guess, upcycling before it was called upcycling. And ever since then, it's just been part of my DNA. And then my second name being Taylor, um, I wanted to learn how to sew. So it's a very like organic timeline. Um, I learned to sew as a New Year's resolution in 2019 and just shifted my focus from carpentry and woodwork to textiles. Um, but saying that, we're, we're not opposed to woodwork or metalwork or anything. We, we take anything that's discarded and being wasted and try to turn it into new things. Um, and we're actually hosting a workshop after this where we're using some scrap materials and we've got some sewing machines. Andrew's bought his um, pipe bender um, and to make some incredible pieces from upcycled products. Um, I guess, from, in my practice, reusing existing materials is actually quite new. This is the first mm. time I've done it in a project, and it's much more built into what, what you do. And I guess, like, I've, it's been a bit of a learning curve for me, like, the, the different approach you have to have to the, the process of the project mm. when the material already has a kind of language and it has... You have to work. You have to work with it. You have to understand like its context, but also t it, it changes like time and resources and money. And I, I wondered like how that impacts what you do. And yeah, it's kind of it's not a blank canvas, which is I found quite nice. Like there's nothing more intimidating than a blank canvas. So if you're taking part an existing product, suddenly there's already a brief set out. You can't turn something that's already a car chair into something totally, totally different because it's already certain panels and patchworking. So if we wanted to make the daybed into one clean piece of fabric, it's physically not possible. So it's almost quite nice having that brief already set out. And that's what made me get into upcycling, that it wasn't intimidating. Um, whereas if it was a blank roll of fabric, the options are almost too endless. I think working with that limitation is almost quite nice. And you can see that in your furniture as well. The lines and shapes are things probably you've not chosen, but just had to work with. Um, and I find it's quite a nice way of working. It should be, it should be more embraced. Um, and even for design students, it's an incredible way to have a, a problem-solving task where it's not a, a blank piece of paper or a blank canvas in a sense. I love what you said about working with the owner of the car's uh, stories and kind of bringing that into the design of the products. Can you talk a little bit about that process um, and kind of that mindset or behavior change, getting people to care about their objects and how that affects sustainable production? Yeah, I mean, I guess the behavior change, um, I guess I wouldn't call it behavior change so much. I'd call it m more of like a cultural change because it's not, it's not about the individuals. It's about kind of like lots of different aspects of society from 
car manufacturers to the government to the way houses are set up. You know, it's, it's quite a broad thing. Um, but th specifically reaching out to the owners of the car, it was quite a long process. Like, uh, to, I, I started off, basically the car was 25 years old. And what it meant was that all of the things that were paid for on the car were paid for in physical receipts. So I had, I had telephone numbers and addresses and a, one or two email addresses. So I started off by sending letters, like handwritten letters to people. And some people responded better than others. Um, some people still haven't responded to this day. Um, but uh, it, it was, it, it took a lot of like, of investment in terms of time for me to, to go and meet these people and reassure them that I wasn't trying to exploit them or make, you know. Um, but ultimately, it made the project so much more rich. And that became the reason for doing it. The reason wasn't to make use of an old car, because actually the most sustainable way to recycle a car is to melt it down and sell it for scrap, which is what happens already. But it, it meant that my purpose was to be a conduit for these stories. Um, and, and as a result, there, there are things that now were recycled that wouldn't have been recycled uh, originally. Um, but, but some of those stories were really trivial. As you can imagine, if anyone has a car here, most of the time you use it to pop to the shops or to drive to a friend's house or do something that you don't really engage with emotionally. But then there, there was the, the first owner of the car I ended up spending quite a long time with. And she, she was telling me about her whole life. And the car became a kind of character in that life from, from, like, from how she dealt with losing a husband um, to cancer uh, to how she regained her own sense of adventure. But, I mean, she, was already, she already had it. But, um, and, then, and then the kind of the pressure of making the objects shifted. So to take a trivial story like going to the shops and turning that into an object that is worth putting on the walls of the V&A is quite a difficult challenge. Um, I don't know if I've succeeded, but you can tell me. Uh, equally, taking a story of somebody losing the love of their life and finding themselves is also a high pressure kind of narrative to, to design an object for. Um, and it, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure which is the more difficult one, but um, it, it, the whole project has put me into situations where I've made objects that I would never make in my own context. And given the opportunity to collaborate um, with people that I would, you know, I've, I've admired from afar, but like I had the reason to reach out and say, let's, do you want to do something together? <laughs> How was Greater Goods on your radar to kind of, you know, how did you guys find each other? I think it's just Instagram. Really. Same network, isn't it? Yeah. I was aware of your work previously. Really? Yeah, I think London's a, a small creative community. It's large, but everyone knows everyone, I find. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a number of small ponds in one big. Um, and so you guys collaborated on the day bed together, but you made the other pieces individually? I did, but, I mean, one thing that's amazing about a car is... It's such a kind of ubiquitous object. Everyone has an idea of it. And I don't particularly love or hate cars. I don't think they should be all destroyed. I don't want to spend my weekends driving around a racetrack. Um, but I find having this kind of neutral position in the middle where you can bring people in that have a really strong view is, is amazing because you can bounce, like you, can, you, can, you feed off of their energy. And Making design in a, in a silo is not what I want to do, and I don't think it's that interesting. I think any time you can bring in a voice of somebody who doesn't think they're a designer, but has some sort of fanatical or expertise in a space, and you can kind of take their language and make them realize that it's useful in designing something. So that, that's one element, but also uh, Jameis was so, like, crucial in the project, we were kind of bouncing ideas off all along and, you know, WhatsApping each other. So even in spaces where I don't think you think you may have had an impact, mm -hmm. you, 
you did, and it, and it kind of, it makes you feel like you're not doing this weird thing on your own in a room. You can kind of like talk to someone about it. And, but I don't know, how, how was it for you? Yeah, it was just uh, such a, a new project for us. We were, we were captured from the very beginning. Um, my colleague Lucas, is a, he's a big car guy, so it was a big yes from him when we got the project. Um, and it was just great when we would meet up and discuss what's going on with the other components of the car. We were talking about the engine block and other elements. Um, and you can see the ideas like bouncing back between us. And then seeing the physical pieces here, um, it's amazing to see what you've been able to repurpose. It's like the, the rims from the car into the, the wine rack. I initially thought it was the engine block, and then we discussed how Andy would cut up the rims. Um, so yeah, it's just amazing to see how far you could take uh, repurposing materials into to new spaces, but see the original DNA of the car. I did want to ask, why the Alpha? Uh, do you know what? It was, it was kind of time pressure, actually. I, I found the Alfa Romeo uh, on eBay, and it had, I, just, I was just searching spares and repairs on eBay, and it had this amazing amount of uh, service history. You know, it had, f it had the letter that was written to the original owner from the garage saying your car's ready to pick up. You know, it's like amazing amount of source material. Um, but I was reluctant, I, di I didn't buy it for about four weeks because I thought, Alfa Romeos have this reputation for being quite a romantic car. And uh, as a result, the audience can be quite blokey. And I didn't want to tell that story. I didn't want to tell a narrow kind of masculine story about cars. But I also, you know, it, and it, I guess it feeds into your practice, the feeling of destroying something that has value. The car didn't have to be taken apart. It could have been restored, but the cost to restore it would have been more than its market value. So that's where this weird space enters in the car market, where it's technically a write-off. But um, uh, it, th that's why I, I, I was reluctant to get it. And at, at, then I, it came to time, you know, the timeline of a project, and I had to buy something. So I bought the car, and it, I was quite pleasantly reassured because reaching out to car people, Alfa Romeo people, I realized that this particular Alfa Romeo was not particularly loved by history. It wasn't Alfa Romeo doing Alfa Romeo at their best. So there aren't many of them left because there aren't many people that want them. Um, but also, the, the, as I said, the first owner was a woman and, and, and that kind of brought in a new conversation. But also everyone that I spoke to in the project had a really different relationship to the car. I was going to ask, um, you know, before we run out of time, often with upcycling, you um, have to bring in some virgin materials, raw materials. So what was that process like, or how did you approach? Was it really important that everything came strictly from the car, or did you add in additional? Um, I guess yeah. similar in the daybed, um, but there was, there was no object I made that was purely the car. And it was because I didn't want to make a room full of things that looked like scrap heap challenge. And it's quite restricting if you're, if you're only using materials from the car. But whenever I brought in new materials, there were all things that already existed in the car. So the, you know, in theory, the rest of the car that got scrapped, uh, you know, those materials would have been replenished. But it wasn't really what I was trying to do. I was trying to create a platform for these materials in the car to tell the story of what it was to these people. Yeah, we, we experienced that a lot of great goods, and this, the day bed especially, we used the whole interior. There was nothing left at the very end. Um, and that really comes down to like the pattern cutting and like the jigsaw puzzle that you have to work with. It's what makes up cycling very time consuming and essentially double the amount of work. It's why it's not scaled up massively in um, production. Um, so it's a, it's a very time consuming process, but when done right, you can see every element that's being used. So if you look on the daybed, there's patches that are like 10 by 10 centimeters, um, which will be off like the headrest of the seat. Um, so using the pieces to its full potential has always been our, our primary focus. And I think that's displayed in the daybed. Amazing. Um, I think we're almost, we've got five minutes. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the lady that first bought the car, any uh, stories that she might have? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Not very long. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll sort of pick some of the, 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell the stories that impacted the object I made. Um, so she was quite an adventurous soul anyway. Uh, she was married to a, a doctor and lived in Richmond. And he, like, he unfortunately passed away from cancer. And when I was talking to her, she was telling me about an experience she had where she realized someone was with her after he died, telling her she was going to be okay, that she now has a life she has to live, and it's like, get on with it. And after that moment, she, she found an advert in the, the paper from Marie Curie, uh, because she was, she was working with Marie Curie through the treatment, um, that she could go to the base camp of Mount Everest. So she trekked to the base camp of Mount Everest, and I, I'm not sure of her exact age, but she was probably like 80, 80 odd at this point. And uh, she then went on this adventure where she took, she traveled on an icebreaker to the Antarctic and retraced Shackleton's steps on his ill-fated voyage. And what's amazing about those, that, that story in particular is that Shackleton, when he was at his most, his lowest point, he recounts a feeling of the, the fact that there was a presence with him guiding him to safety. And since that moment, there have been hundreds of recounts of this exact phenomenon. It was actually referenced in The Wasteland uh, by T.S. Eliot, which is on the wall of the gallery. But this, I, this feeling of, in, you, in your darkest time, having someone metaphorically put their hand on your shoulder and say, you're going to be okay, you're going to... So then it's like, how do I turn that into an object? So I, I've designed a nightlife, a, a nightlight, a nightlight that um, uh, is made from parts of the engine cut up. And the kind of the literal sense is it's something that reassures you in a, in a dark, dark time. But also it's, it's kind of like a, a presence in some way. But it's a trivial object in comparison to the story from the lady. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It's really interesting. Um, it's just a question out of cu curiosity. If you already have a, like, a next project in your mind, like a next object you want to work with? I sort of do, but I don't know if this is the test bed. I don't know if I should. <laughs> um, I, I had an idea that I, I, I like the fact that stories can become a kind of a way of extracting some sort of reason to do something. So I thought I would basically find an excuse to get 10 or 12 people that I think are really interesting that I wouldn't have a reason to speak to them otherwise and almost sort of place myself as a bit of a therapist and just talk to them about their life. And, and hopefully there would be this same thing of depth and, and kind of surface level stuff. And who knows what it would result in, but I'm not sure on that yet. We have time for one more. What about you? What's next for you? Um, need to check the calendar to be honest we're doing uh, I guess the workshop after this yeah. <laughs> the workshop after this is what's next for me um, but yeah we're, we're constantly working on projects um, everything's so different that we're kind of focusing on um, we're actually have helping a few brands internally on how to scale up um, upcycling into production so that's probably our, our long term project that we're working on next amazing well thank you very much for joining us um, and uh, I hope to join you for your workshop later <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very much.